already discussed several symmetries in the standard model. We've talked about charge conservation, we've talked about baryon number and lepton number conservation, and most recently we discussed the isospin flavor symmetry that was really an accidental symmetry of the standard model that comes about because the up and the down quark have almost identical masses. However, there are three very fundamental symmetries that underlie the standard model. And these are charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal. Or, if you put all three of them together, C, P, and T. And together, the C, P, T symmetry, so all three of these together, is a fundamental symmetry of special relativity. So, together, these three symmetries have to be conserved, or, if it's not uh, observed in the standard model, then we've broken relativity, which would be a pretty major thing to happen. So, what physicists have done in the standard model is, instead of looking at all of these three together, we, we have looked at all three together, but you can also separate them out and look at them one at a time. And so the first of these we're going to look at is the P, parity. So let's have a look in some detail about what the parity symmetry is and what it means in terms of particles. So the symmetry we're going to talk about first of all is called parity. And that's usually abbreviated with a capital P. And what parity is, is if you take your, your x, y and z axes, you reverse the direction of all three spatial axes. So essentially, you know, your coordinates in when you've done a parity transform will become exactly the negative of what they were before. And so you can think of this as a, uh, uh, as a mirror. A mirror does a partial parity transform. If I put a vector in front of a mirror, the reflected, and this is the, uh, you know, the plane of the mirror is perpendicular to the screen here and I put a, a, a vector in front of the mirror, then the reflected image in the mirror is going to be in exactly the opposite direction, provided the vector is pointing along the one axis that the mirror reflects. Obviously, if I point the vector up like this, then of course in the mirror the image will be up, because a mirror will only invert um, depending on how you define your axes, but if we say that uh, this is the uh, x direction, then the mirror only inverts the x axis to minus x. It doesn't do anything about y and z. So <clears throat> a mirror um, is an example of a, of a sort of partial parity transform, but in general, if I have a vector, so if I have a, a, a vector, let's say r, um, that has uh, components x, y, and z, then under parity transformation, I will end up with exactly the negative of the vector. So I essentially uh, flip vectors around when you do a parity transform on them. However, there is a certain class of vector for which that isn't true. And that is things like angular momentum spin vectors. So if you think about how we define uh, um, angular momentum, if we've got a particle here, it's moving with a velocity, <coughs> or a momentum rather, uh, p here, and it has a distance r from uh, wherever we're taking the angular momentum about. It doesn't matter, this can be any arbitrary point here. Then the angular momentum vector is going to be r cross p. Now, if I do a parity transformation on that, so under a parity transformation, then I have minus r, because the spatial axes are inverted, and I will have crossed with minus p, because the spatial axes are all inverted. And so this, of course, is actually equal to L. So under a parity transform, ordinary vectors are inverted. Um, angular momentum vectors, spin vectors, remain the same and do not change. So let's have a look at what this means in terms of a particle. So here we have a particle. So we've got a, a particle here, and it is moving, right? 
and we have a spin because we can pick any axis that we have for our z component, if you like, of spin, when we've got motion, we pick the direction of motion as the z component of spin. So this is our, if you like, mj value. So <clears throat> we have a particle, it's moving, and in this case we have spin that is opposite to the, a spin vector that is opposite to the direction of motion, and so we call this left-handed state, and we call it helicity, right? So this particle here, where the spin is opposite to the direction of motion, or the one component of spin that's quantized is opposite to the direction of motion, we call that the left-handed helicity state. Now, under a parity transform, the momentum of the particle will invert. So the motion here under parity is flipped. But the spin spin vector, as we just showed, is not flipped. And so that means that now, under a parity transform, we have the motion of the particle and the spin of the particle both pointing in the same direction, and so we say that these this is a right-handed helicity state. Now, if the mass of this particle is equal to zero, these helicity states, that the particle will always be in an eigenstate of the helicity. And that's because there's no center of mass frame for the particle. In other words, you can't run faster than the particle because the particle is massless, it's traveling at the speed of light. But if m is not equal to zero, then the left and right states are mixed by the mass of the particle. And the reason for that is quite simple to imagine because if I ran in this direction fast enough, then I would be able to reverse the motion of the particle so it would be moving this way, and now the motion of the particle would be aligned to the spin of the particle, and so it would be right-handed. And the larger the mass m here of the particle, then the easier it is to do that. So massless particles are always in a helicity eigenstate. Massive particles are in a mixture, they, they can be predominantly left-handed or predominantly right-handed, but there's always a little bit of the other state mixed in there because the mass is not zero. Now, the one uh, sort of real, so, well, not exception, but, you know, for a neutrino where the mass of the neutrino is approximately zero, um, but not zero. We know it's not zero, but we know it's probably down at the electron volt or lower. Well, we know it's at the electron volt or lower levels. And in fact, there's suggestions that it may be at the milli electron volt level. So the mass is so incredibly low that <clears throat> here for the neutrino, um, we effectively have the neutrino in a left-handed or right-handed helicity eigenstate. But it's, again, not 100%, but because the mass is so small, it's a very, very, very good approximation. Now, until 1956, parity was thought to be a fundamental symmetry. It had already been verified that the electromagnetic force and the strong force both conserved parity. So the scene was set to test the weak force. And in 1956, the Chinese uh, physicist C.S. Wu conducted an experiment in the US that tested the uh, parity of the, the, whether the weak force can serve parity. What she did was she cooled a sample of cobalt-60, which undergoes beta decay. She cooled it to about 3 millikelvin and stuck it in an intense magnetic field. And this caused a large fraction of the um, spins of the cobalt nuclei to line up with the magnetic field. And what she observed when that happened was that the electrons were all emitted in the opposite direction to the nuclear spin. That was parity violation. And it was confirmed because when she flipped the magnetic field, the direction the electrons were emitted flipped because, of course, the spin of the nuclei that were decaying had flipped too. So, when you have that distribution, what it meant was that there was clear, unambiguous evidence of parity violation, and not just a small 
breaking of the parity symmetry, it turns out that the weak force maximally violates the parity symmetry. And so what this means is that W and Z bosons will only couple to particles that are in the left-handed helicity state or the right-handed right -hand, right state if they're an antiparticle. So it's maximally violated, parity is maximally violated by the weak interaction. Now this was an astounding discovery and sadly, although there was a Nobel Prize awarded to it, for it. The discovery only won a Nobel Prize for the two theorists, uh, Li and Yang, who had suggested uh, testing, uh, you know, suggested mechanisms for violating parity in weak interactions. Uh, C.S. Wu, unfortunately, was not awarded the Nobel Prize. She, in fact, she was nominated for it so many times that they eventually, uh, she was one of the reasons why they made the nomination list uh, for the Nobel Prize uh, confidential um, to avoid public outcry. So it was a rather sad state of affairs uh, for the Nobel Prize Committee back then. However, she was later recognized with the inaugural award of the uh, Wolf Prize in 1979. So, what we now have is maximally violated parity by the weak interaction. And for one particular particle, that has interesting consequences. Because neutrinos can only interact through the weak interaction. And what that means is that every neutrino in the universe is basically left-handed. Because the neutrinos have almost zero mass, and so are almost in a perfect helicity eigenstate. So, to a good approximation, every neutrino out there is left-handed and every anti-neutrino is right-handed. Um, we now need to talk about another one of the fundamental symmetries and this time it's the C symmetry, charge conjugation. And for charge conjugation, that symmetry is swapping all matter with antimatter and vice versa. So let's have a look and see what that implies. So the symmetry we're going to talk about now is called charge conjugation. And it's abbreviated with a capital C, and essentially it's the operator where we change matter into antimatter or antimatter into matter. So if I operate a charge conjugation on, for example, a proton state, that will give me an antiproton. So a proton is clearly not an eigenstate of charge conjugation. Similarly, if I operate charge conjugation on an electron, then I end up with a positron. And so again, this is not an eigenstate of charge conjugation operator. However, there are some particles which are eigenstates. If I do charge conjugation on a photon, for example, then I get minus the original photon. So I have an eigenvalue of minus one, and a photon is its own antiparticle. Similarly, if I do charge conjugation on a pi zero, um, then I end up with uh, just the pi zero state. So I have an eigenstate of charge conjugation, and this time with an eigenvalue of plus one. Now, even though individual particles may not be eigenstates, we can lump particles together and look at charge conjugation operating on a multi-particle state. So if I operate charge conjugation on a state of pi plus, pi minus, then I end up with a state of pi minus, pi plus. Uh, so I have the same two particles I started with. Now, the eigenvalue here is minus 1 to the L, where L is the angular momentum uh, magnitude of the pi plus, pi minus state. So if they're in the ground state and angular momentum is 0, then this is just a, a plus 1 uh, value for the eigenvalue. Now, <clears throat> having done that, we can now ask, well, are the interactions of the standard model invariant under charge conjugation? Well, it turns out that electromagnetism 
and um, the strong interactions are indeed invariant. A proton will have the same strong interactions as an antiproton, so there's no change there, just as an electron will have the same electromagnetic interactions as a positron. Obviously, the charge is different, has flipped, um, but just as it has here for the strong force, but the interactions are identical. The same processes occur. There's no unambiguous way to say whether it's an electron that's my, uh, you know, you, you could say, well, give the electron a positive charge and give the positron a minus charge, and that would work equally well for electromagnetism. It's only by convention that we, we do things this way round. So what about the weak interaction? Well, it's easy to see that charge conjugation is completely broken by the weak interaction. Because if I take a charge conjugation operator operating on a left-handed neutrino, it doesn't matter what the flavor is, it's a left-handed neutrino. Now, left-handed neutrinos will feel weak interactions because they're left-handed particles. But when I do the charge conjugation operation on it, I end up with a left-handed anti-neutrino because charge conjugation does not flip the helicity states. And this, of course, because it's a left-handed antiparticle, feels no weak interaction. So the fact that charge conjugation, so the fact that the weak force violates parity also means that it completely violates charge conjugation. And so it's easy, I mean, you know, that's the quick demonstration to show that the weak force again is the odd person, the odd interaction out and maximally violates charge conjugation. So we can now see that just as the weak force violates parity, it also violates charge conjugation because a left-handed neutrino interacts with the weak force, but a left-handed antineutrino will not. But what happens if we put our two symmetries together and we look at the combined CP symmetry? So that means that we do a charge conjugation operation and then a parity operation. So if we think about the left-handed neutrino, we do charge conjugation, it becomes a left-handed antineutrino, and then we do parity, and it becomes a right-handed antineutrino, and that will interact with the weak force. So the question now is, does the weak force conserve CP symmetry? Now to answer that, we need to look at a different system. That is the system involving kaons. Now, what makes the kaon system so unique and you know, very useful for investigating the CP uh, symmetry is that a kaon can oscillate into an anti-kaon by either of these two box diagrams. And so it's a doubly weak process, so there's two W bosons involved. Um, but what it means is, is that if you start with a beam of K0, after some time, it will be a mixture of you know, uh, K0 plus some content of K0, oops, K0 bar. So no matter how you start, so you can start by producing it in a strong interaction that will produce a strong eigenstate like K0 or K0 bar, and then as the kaon propagates, this weak interaction takes over and you end up with a mixture of the K0 and K0 bar um, states. So what does that mean for CP? Well, let's have a look uh, at what the CP operator does on a kaon. So let's have a look at the CP operator acting on K0. Well, K0 is a pseudo-scalar meson. And what that means is that when the parity operator operates on it, it has a parity value of minus one. And so we end up with minus the charge conjugation operator operating on K0. And of course, this is just flipping matter into antimatter. So this simply converts it into K0 bar. So CP operating on a K0 gives us minus K0 bar, and similarly, by exactly the same mechanism, CP operating on K0 bar gives us minus K0. So the kaon and the anti-kaon by themselves are not a CP eigenstate, but we can construct a mixture of the two which is. So I'm going to start by calling the first mixture K1, and we're going to say that this is 1 over root 2 for normalization of k0 minus 
k0 bar. And when I uh, operate, uh, do my CP operation on it, well, this will flip to, so the k0 here will flip to minus k0 bar. The minus k0 bar here will flip to plus k0, so I end up with the same state again. So my CP eigenvalue is plus 1. Similarly, if I uh, construct a mixture, and we'll call this k2, that's equal to 1 over root 2, again for normalization, and this time k0 plus k0 bar, then if I operate CP on it, well, this goes to my, the, the first term here, k0, goes to minus k0 bar. The k0 bar term goes to minus k0, so I've got exactly minus 1 times what I started with. So it's a CP eigenstate with an eigenvalue of minus 1. Now, we've constructed now two k on eigenstates, one with a CP plus 1 and one with a CP minus 1. So to understand why this is important, we now need to look at how the k on decays into pions. So what you're seeing here are the a example of Feynman diagrams. They're not the only uh, uh, tree-level Feynman diagrams for a k on decaying into a two-charged pion or two-neutral pion final state, or a three-charged pion. Well, okay, two charged and one neutral, or three neutral pion final state. And so a k on can decay to either two pions or three pions. But here's the kicker. The CP value for a two pion final state is equal to plus one, right? You end up with the two pions again, and you have a CP eigenvalue of plus one. CP on a three pion state is equal to minus the original three pi on state. And that's because of the parity operator, because um, pi ons are pseudo scalar. So what that means is, is that the two pi on final states can, if CP is conserved in the weak interaction, then the two pi on final states can only be decayed into by the K1 state. Uh, if you remember, the K1 state had CP um, plus 1, and so this is, if CP is conserved, can only decay into the 2 pi on final state, and the K2 state, which has CP minus 1, can only decay into the 3 pi on final state. Okay, all well and good, but this also provides us a means to separate out these two states, because remember, we're going to produce these as uh, you know in a strong a strong state by smashing something onto a target, and that'll produce either a k0 or k0 bar. But the weak interaction mixes them, and so what propagates is some combination of k1 plus this k2 state, right? Which essentially combine together to give you the right mixture of k0, k0 bar, which is changing and evolving as they propagate because the k-ons are oscillating between k0, k0 bar. Okay, so how does this allow us to separate them? Well, look at the mass difference here. So a k-on has a mass of 498 uh, MeV over c squared. And a charged pion has a mass of 140 MeV over c squared. And a neutral pion is almost as massive. It's 135 MeV over c squared. So <clears throat> if we look at this, this is going from uh, 498 MeV down to, uh, in this case, um, 280. Right. So we've got a mass difference here. But if we look at the uh, three pion uh, state here, then this is 498. But because we're now producing three pions, we've got 280 plus the mass of this guy, which is another 135. So we're at uh, 400, and if I've got the math right, 15, and then MeV over C squared, right? And the same units uh, for here as well, right? So the difference in mass for the three pion decay is a lot, lot less than it is for the two pion decay. And that means that 
the kaon that undergoes this decay is going to be long lived because it decays more slowly if it can only decay into three pions. And that gives us a way to separate out the two states. If we can, we, t we can take the kaons and we can say, well, there's a short-lived kaon and there's a long-lived kaon state. And if CP is conserved, the long-lived kaon state should be the CP equals to um, minus one, and that will be the and that will only decay into three pions. So the long-lived kaon state must be the one that decays into three pions and only three pions if CP is conserved by the weak interaction. So this happy coincidence that the two possible decays for the two possible CP states of kaons. Um, and one of them having a short lifetime because of the large phase space and the other one having a long lifetime because of the small phase space meant that we could actually now test to see whether the weak force violated CP. And that test was conducted in 1963 by Christiansen, Cronin, Fitch and Turley. What they did was they took a beam of kaons and they produced it by smashing protons into a target and removing all the charged particles and then the only neutral particles uh, of any consequence that are left are in fact kaons. And then what they did was they went a long, 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 long way, hundreds of meters downstream from where the kaons were being produced. Now, that distance downstream, all the short-lived kaons that would be decaying into two pions would have disappeared from the beam because of their short lifetime. And all that was left were the long-lived kaons. And the long-lived kaons, having a CP state of minus one, should only decay into three pions. What they observed changed our understanding of fundamental symmetries considerably because what they saw was about one in 1,000 of these long-lived kaons decayed into two pions. And that was an unambiguous proof that the CP symmetry was being broken. And in fact, the phenomenon is called CP violation. This had some profound consequences. For a start, it meant that we now had an unambiguous way to separate matter and antimatter. In other words, the laws of physics for matter and antimatter are not the same. Now, this has been long suspected because, you know, universe starting in a big bang, we're now in a universe that's full of matter, and so that means that there has to be some reason why more matter was created in the big bang than antimatter and the excesses the universe we see today. Now, we still don't understand how that happens, but for that to happen, you have to have CP violation. And furthermore, there was then a mystery of exactly how this CP violation was occurring in kaons. Some people suggested, well, maybe there's some extra super weak interaction uh, that's out there, and that's the thing that violates CP, but the weak interaction doesn't violate CP. Um, then, even within the standard model, there was the question about, well, what's the, is the CP violation occurring as the kaons mix, or is it occurring when the kaons decay? Now, those questions required future generations of experiments, one of which I actually worked on as a grad student myself, which was NA48, that was the first to really unambiguously show us that there was CP violation occurring in the decays and in the mixing of the kaons. And that's what we'll talk about in the next video.